Welcome back to the Budding Author Podcast. Today we are talking to Shanae. How are you today? Are you still there I'm with well me? today. Thank you, Simon. It's good to be here. It's very it's good, good to, to have be you here. With us. Very good to have you with us. It's um it's a crazy old world we live in now. Um and um your history, your history is quite good. Um been through a lot, haven't you? Uh yes, I have physically, mentally, and health wise, definitely. But you adapt and you keep moving forward. That's it. I think we were saying just before we went on air, how sort of so you're a you're a romance author. Um how romance has changed and um the previous world of uh, the guys being the hunters has sort of changed somewhat, hasn't it? Yeah, well, yeah, that's what I was saying. Like with the um the last few generations with the, the more power woman emerging, the women are, are becoming more aggressive than what the um men, like the men were the hunters, now the women are becoming the hunters. The hunters become the hunted. <laughs> Circling their prey. So um, are you going to take that into your writing or are you still uh, I already the have. I, yeah, I already have. Um, in The Love Mentalist, she's actually a love guru who combines um, her, her profession with body language. And yeah. um, it's quite funny because I started that because she um, doesn't like the word cougar and she refused to go out with men younger. And yeah. But men do, don't have a title when they date younger women. So no. I was sort of playing around with that. And it or actually it started when I was watching, I was at a girlfriend's place and I was having coffee and in the background she had the TV on. And there was this guy from America who kept pronouncing the word pergola, pergola. And I'm going, it's pergola, you idiot. <laughs> That's how we <laughs> pronounce it out here. And then he sort of asked another question, and I'm thinking, no, you don't pronounce. We don't pronounce it like that. So it sort of started off with that um, Australian girl and the American man, and it, it's a lot of fun play. But like he's 15 years younger, and and that sort of romance, and he does what he does, and she's this love guru, and there's all these men wanting to take her down because she's the best in the world at what she does. So what I used to do, I have actually put into the book and created a story from it. So it's, there's five books in the series. So it's been picked up by a publisher. So, um, yeah. Who's, who's going to be the publisher for that? Edit, Edit Tingle. Edit Tingle. Yeah. He's, um, um, they're the same ones um, that J.D. Um, Edwards picked up his book indomitable and yeah. uh yeah so after being mentored by them but sorry by him he um they said send us um a, you know the manuscript and you know within 24 hours i had an answer that's um that's such a good route isn't it um having a mentor and uh, having that connection to it's working with your network isn't it to sort of get yourself into publishing and houses and that sort of thing well that's, it was uh, funny that's JD, a good old group, that. Well, it is. Well, yes and no. JD reached out to me because I was on Twitter one day and we were talking about editing. And um, and I mentioned something about my, my brain injury that I had. And he contacted me and he actually helped me edit the last page, which was the first book Edit Tingle brought out. And he actually mentored me through every every step of that. And I asked for brutal honesty. I mean, I can take take it on the chin. and But he made me a better writer. So even today when I sent my newest book to my editor, Bambi Summers, she said, I cannot believe how strong your writing is now. She said, I only have to go through this once. So usually an edit's like two or three times. And yeah. she was... Yeah, so she said, so being mentored by him, and you know what, he did it for me. He took the time out of his life to do that for me. Like it was a six-month process, yeah. but he did it selfless, selflessly. Like 
I couldn't have been happier <clears throat> to have somebody on my side who could help me point out my faults. <clears throat> I think that's it. I think we can get all sort of encompassing with our own writing. Um, you need that fresh, fresh view, don't you? And uh, you need somebody impartial that's going to give you the brutal honesty. Um, well, that's I, true. I think, as, as I mentioned uh, before we came on air, uh, um, I was part of a writing group and um, I wanted everybody to be really harsh and really sort of strong on that. But when you're checking each other's work, um, it's difficult to stay 100 percent uh, honest, I think. Because, you know, if you're overcritical on uh, your work, then uh, someone, <laughs> someone might sort of uh, do the same, as it were. Which I think is perfect. It is what you want, but I mean, people just hold back, don't they? Yeah, but people also have different concepts of your writing style. Like as a writer, you know, we have different styles. Now I write the third person, and my co-host Katrina she writes the first person, and we sort of wrote a book together. And yeah. it was um, actually we went through the podcast um, on this the other day, but she had to learn how to adapt to my writing style and she said it made her a better writer because she could see how I structured the sentences and the narration in yeah. the third person than what she writes in the first person. So in a way that was a learning tool for her as well. But you've got these other people, like I'm a big um Daniel Steele and, and Barbara Taylor about Bradford fan. Now, yeah. I go back to when they started writing and their books today and their style have changed. So they've progressed with writing and um, keeping up with the way things are in this modern age. But it makes me wonder if this modern age judge them on their books back then would have they yeah. been as successful as they are today? Interesting. Because there's more yeah. criticism. I think um, with your having your mentor, mentor J.D. Edwards, you actually uh, took your previous books off sale, didn't you? Yeah, I took them all down and I've reworked them and um, am in the process of re-publishing um, them again now. Yeah. And it was worth it. Well, I, I did something similar, actually, with my trilogy. Um, initially, um, the heat level was too high, and I had some some uh, put some people off, I think, because it was a bit too graphic. Um, so I completely re-edited all of mine. And uh, I'd say, as I mentioned, I'm putting the book trailers now together. Um, it's on a, a more palatable level, I think, is the, yeah, is the phrase. And what genre is that? Um, it's like sci-fi sci -fi drama, sort of relationship dramas. Yeah. Um, when people when people say sci-fi, you sort of get the idea about sort of everything's in space. But, I mean, in some ways we're in a sci-fi world now because um, everything that's happening with technology. Um, my first novel, Finding Love in 2045, my biggest fear doing that was that everything would happen before I would got it published. <laughs> Um, and now, <laughs> the 2045, uh, the things I've put in tw for my vision of the future for 2045, um, a lot of those things are actually starting to happen. And um, and I think in, by 2030... Well, that's funny you've said that. It's funny you said that because I started writing a conspiracy about COVID and <laughs> all these things that were happening um, and all these things, conspiracy theories I came up with, um, I'm, I was talking to my girlfriend. I said, look, if I put this book out, I said, I'm on the list for the Chinese government to come after me. <laughs> and, and so I put it away. <laughs> I put it. But the conspiracy ideas and theories I came out, out with, I'm not joking, five out of the ten were revealed to be true. Yeah. So, and I'm sort of thinking, oh, my God, you know, but that they came out before I sort of got to the book to publish it. Yeah. But as you said, writing something that's going to happen in like twenty years, for it, someone's going to break the news somewhere. 
Yeah. Well, the thing is, I think I did a lot of research. I was um, investing quite heavily in future technology um, through an exponential investor. Um, so I got some really good information of things that were in development. So I thought I was seeing how they would go and how they would move forward. Um, so I, I went on the basis of like if they do happen, because um, a key port, a key part of that, which um, it's not giving away too much of the book to do that, but um, the the lead character has um, a robot assistant, like a house house robot, and um, and during during the course of the book, the technology for that robot increases, and um, so like sort of livable skin appearing on the robot compared to the sort of like the shiny parts and that sort of thing as um as it's developing and uh with the uh artificial general intelligence that sort of uh, is on the way um that was sort of in line with that um so that was uh it was fun it was a fun book very emotional it's so uh, i wouldn't uh possibly admit the fact that I was uh, in tears reading it when before I published it. <laughs> you, you, sort of, uh, you get into your characters, don't you, and um, feel... Oh, they become, yeah, they become your babies and you don't want to part with them. So that's why yeah. I turned mine into a series. <laughs> so I well, uh, that's, uh, that's what happened, really. Um, Mia, um, I became very close to Mia, the character, and... Um, it was I feel for her when she went through some of her troubles. It's a relationship growth story, um, and in the follow up, which is sort of the end of the series, effectively, Awoken in twenty forty six, um, that is much more technological sci fi sort of advancements, and um, so uh, the Neuralink, Neuralink sort of uh, idea sort of comes into play. So that is sort of covered within that. Um, as far as um, getting back to you, because this is about you, not me. <laughs> <laughs> um, JD Edwards, how did that relationship come together? How did you uh, find out about them? How did they? How did the connection happen? Oh, he, I tweeted something on um, Twitter, and he contacted me, and he says, "Look, um, if you want some help, I will help you. Simple as that." He just reached mm -hmm. out and paying it forward. And, um, yeah, so for six months I drove him crazy. And But you know what? I have never met a man with the most or the widest vocabulary I have ever seen. The words and descriptions and the placement of those words in sentences honestly took me to a new level and at one stage I actually thought I'm never going to become a good writer after reading what he helped me with like but I kept going I kept going and like I'm always searching for the thesaurus or the dictionary on on power verbs and but they just roll off his tongue like he's just a master at that sort of thing and I've never seen another person's writing as strong as what his is yeah. So he does um, fantasy books. But, okay. um, yeah, so that's, he just reached out to me and um, he's a good friend. He's a really nice guy and I just wish him all the best. We talk often, every so every now and then. Is he, is he um, based in Australia the same as yourself? No, he's in America. Oh, he's in America, okay. okay. Yeah, so, yeah, contact anyone around the world these days. He could contact me and help me if he likes. <laughs> so, but it was just interesting to have him selflessly say, oh, okay, this poor girl needs help. <laughs> so, and he just reached out and um, I sent him the first three chapters and he sent it back uh, about a week later and I looked at it and I cried for the first week. <laughs> and then I said, oh, my God, should I just scrap this and move on? And he said, no, nah. he says, we're going to work together to get the whole book done. Yeah. So he took time out of his life to help me. And now I do the same thing for other people in different ways, like with books and, you know, promoting and things like that. So paying think, it forward. I think that's, that's a tremendous thing. I think obviously when I get mass, massively successful, I will do the same. 
I think. <laughs> yeah. I don't that's think my, either of us. That's my house. That's my house. When my uh, when my books have gone to movies and that sort of thing, um, I will be doing just that. Yeah, he's actually yeah. writing a screenplay for Indomitable, so it's been a very successful book for him. So, yeah. um, and that's good. I hope wish him all the luck. The um, we we talked a little bit about body language. Um, describing body language in your writing, um, how much of that is a challenge for you? Um, well, it's basically only in the love mentalist because that's her job. She's a love guru who's made her career on combining love and body language. And um, when I sort of step back from doing the body language um, myself, I incorporated it into my books because my health wouldn't allow me to do what I was about to do with yeah. um, like speaking about the whole thing. So I actually turned what I know into the book. So the love mentalist is um, she teaches people how to find love and what um, to look out for, how to, um, you know, to work out who's lying and what lies and their body language is telling them. Like, you know, just the basic, a smile. Like people smile and then there's a genuine smile. And when you get a genuine smile, you get the, um, the, the little wrinkles around your eyes. That's a genuine smile. I've got wrinkles so, around my eyes regardless of whether I'm smiling. <laughs> I think that's an age thing, I think. <laughs> so, Sinead, tell me, if um, I, I've, got, I've got two characters who, um, who are ve know each other very well, so um, how would we describe the um, a, just subtle gestures to uh, show the connection. What would uh, what, give me an example of what you're well, doing? Well, if you're, when you're, on if the you're spot, sitting, I realize that. No, that's okay. Like if you're sitting down opposite one another, now like you're looking at me, and then if I'm talking and he's interested in what I'm saying, he'll look me straight in the eyes. A lot of the time, he'll put his elbows on the table and lean forward and and listen to what I'm saying. Where if he wasn't interested, he'd be looking around for an escape to think, how in the hell am I going to get out of here? Yeah. So, and then there's other little gestures. And the one thing I have a problem with is that body expert, body language experts will say, if you put a drink right in front of you, you're closing yourself off. Where When it comes okay. to love, I, I totally disagree. Because when it comes to love, and I'm one of these people, I like to reach across and touch somebody's hand. It's more of a touchy-feely thing. Where, you know, when you're sitting down, most people are right-handed, so your drink's on the right and his is on the on the left of you. So if you reach across with either hand, you're going to knock one of the glasses over. <laughs> so, and that's why I, I say to people, look, you're not closing your, yourself off. It is a, a matter of actual, um, what do you call it, um, Oh, I can't think of the word, see? <laughs> this is what happens. <laughs> it's a matter of spatial awareness, you know, yeah. around you. So that's the one problem with body language I have with. But there's also... Yeah, I think, what, I think what, as far as description, as far as descriptions of uh, body language, I think I need to sort of expand my, uh, my game there, I think. Because, um, like, a, a slight touch on the shoulder and... Um, a shrug and an eye roll and that sort of thing. I, I think I'm probably using that a little bit too much. Um, well, sort of you know what? The head sort of thing and a half smile. Yeah. Sort of, okay. Uh, You're confused. You're worried. Okay. <laughs> I get it. But the, the, the thing is too, like um, with the um, eye rolling and things like that, I, when I watch those reality shows, which my character hates with, absolution um and they roll their eyes and i and i'll say to my son or whatever i say i'd hate to leave my socks on the floor if she was i was married to her <laughs> <laughs> but but you know rolling the eyes is like frustration it has different meanings it could mean frustrations impatience or you know a few different things that people you know need to decode yeah. at, at how your partner 
and your partner is the best person to decode because over time you get to know them and you get to know their quirks and and their uh, what they every little movement means and yeah. um and it, it's a great way to learn actually by watching your partner but it's good to have a few things in common to learn because it helps you in everyday life with get, like getting a job or being yeah. in a group of people like he's a good one for you i was at a seminar not um oh, last year i think it was and i was talking to a man afterward who afterwards who brought his girlfriend and we were just talking about the seminar and she comes over and um she looks at me and i smile and she just sort of gave me daggers and i thought oh, okay here we go jealous girlfriend and so and we were just kept talking he didn't introduce her to me Next thing you know, she crosses her arms and moves in closer to him. And and I thought, oh, this is going to get, you know, a little bit testy here. And I said to him, I said, I'm going to go now be because I don't want to be in the middle of this argument. And he says, <laughs> what argument? And I said, wait for it. And I sort of walked off and I could hear her giving him the riot act as I walked away. Yeah. I, so, I, I, have a similar, I had a similar situation. Um, we'd been, uh, my wife my wife and I had been out with her mum and uh, someone came across to the table and uh, and they were talking to them, but they didn't introduce me. So um, I was sort of not happy with that. So, yeah, and you, I, if I was there, I could tell by your face. Yeah. <laughs> you Stiffen your shoulders, pull your shoulders back and, you know, puff out your chest and crush your arms. It was a lot of different things, but it's a good identifier. And I actually learned a lot more when I was working with battered women who, who were really hard for me to um, decode in the first place because they learned not to move a muscle. Yeah. So because anything could trigger off their partner. And it was really interesting to see the difference between a joyful 30-year-old going about their life happily married and all that and a 30-year-old woman who have lived through these relationships and these barriers and the difference in their body language, talking to other people, it was oh, blew my mind, absolutely blew my mind. Yeah. I think... Um... Yeah. When with our writing, I think we the, we talk about the dialogue and uh, the dialogue can be quite easy for me, um, keeping realistic dialogue. But then we need to think of sort of like the move, movement and the shapes and that sort of thing of what the uh, bodies are doing. Um, what, what's your what's your writing process now with the uh, your, uh, <laughs> your uh, my, writing? I actually use a headset when I write, but. All my, believe it or not, all my um, books come to me in dreams because my brain never switches off. This is why I have insomnia because even though I try to sleep, my brain still keeps going. So, um, and then what I do is usually three to five days, I have the whole story in my head. So I will bullet point all those things that happen in the chapters. So in chapter one, I have this happens, in chapter two, this happens, and then I usually write the beginning and the end, and then I pants all the other chapters in between. But okay. I don't necessarily do it in order. Like um, if if something, if one chapter excites me more, it could be chapter 23, I will write that because I know what's in that chapter. That's and jumping, I, around, jumping around quite a lot. I don't think I could do that. I think for me it has to, I, I sort of do it like, in sequence a lot of people do my um co-host she does it in sequence as well she looks at the whole thing as a book where i t look at it as, as as a jigsaw puzzle but um and but the thing is it works for me and then i just put on my headset and i could um you know give you three chapters in a couple of hours yeah i unedited it i mean they have to be edited of course but um for me talking i can actually write faster and quicker <clears throat> because i don't lose my focus where if yeah. i was sitting at a keyboard typing 20 minutes i'm done my focus is gone where yeah. by reading the story out in my mind it records it and i could do like two or three hours just talking and then when you when you're catching up on that you're just listening back to it and typing it up against that then Yes, and then I and then I sort of think, what the hell was I saying there? 
<laughs> you know, it doesn't, it's not 100% accuracy with what you say. But then I go back and then um, once it's all complete, I'll go back and edit it visually and yeah. um, fix up the subplots and things like that. And then I'll give it to my editor to um, – I'll, actually, I'll give it to a, a few um, better readers. I, I'm not one of these people who need alpha readers, but I'll send it to a better reader just to find consistency flow, where they yawn, where they think um, I haven't finished a subplot off. Then I'll fix yeah. those and then I'll send it to the editor. Uh, yeah, yeah so uh, my process is slightly different. Like – if I get stuck on, on a word or a sentence, I will um, put 10 question marks and I'll highlight it in a different colour, which means yeah. that, okay, I need to come back and find a word for that or I need to yeah. come back and find the sentence or I need to match up like in I use green for a timeline. So there's all these green lines through my manuscript to make sure that the timeline works. But that's just my process. It doesn't work for everybody, but as I said, with the TBI and ADD, um, I've had to, and chronic fatigue, I've had to adapt to what works for me, and that's what works for me. And um, that's uh, that's part of the uh, part of the thing with uh, the budding author podcast to hear about different authors doing things their way in different ways. So it, there's not one fixed way that it needs to be done. There's there's multiple multiple ways and multiple variations and uh, there's the plotters the pantsers and the everything in between and that's uh, that's perfectly right that's perfectly okay as long as you're writing and uh, again you're writing critiqued and um, edited then uh, that's all good that's right and you know what on, as I said on Facebook on, lately I've seen people say I want to become a writer where do I start and I'm sort of well, thinking you just have, haven't you <laughs> And, and, like, it, it, it amazes me how many people think that becoming a writer, you become rich overnight. Like, and they might be a diamond in the rough, don't get me wrong, but they have no concept of what actually goes into it. And then when they finish writing it, they think, oh, okay, it's finished, it's published. But they don't realise that it might not be <laughs> as they think i mean i've read every time someone brings out a new book on twitter i'll look it up and read the first chapter and i'm thinking this isn't ready to be published like it's not no, no. complete it needs a good edit and and i think that's a lot of the problem with today's authors so they rush to get it and i was one of them yeah. but they rush to get get it to market to start making money well, uh, what I would, uh, so, what I would and say, then, you know, they say, you, oh, sorry, I was going to say, they I'm, can't afford an editor. Yeah. Yeah, they can't afford an editor. So, and in this economy, yes, but there are some people who um, will do payment plans for you uh, or will yeah. edit, say, the first six six chapters and then you can see what mistakes you're making. And that will help you along. So well, you know, I've ways on, around on it. Readsy, um, Sinead, on 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 Readsy, they have uh, writing courses, and people can put in their work for have it professionally edited and that sort of thing. I've put mine in there, and it's never been selected. And the ones they select always seem really bad. So I think mine must be okay according to that. So <laughs> what what, what I would say is, anybody that's watching this, including yourself, and what it's listening to this. Um, have a look at the uh, the free introduction for each of my novels and uh, tell me if you think it's uh, okay or it needs an editor, um, needs re-editing. Um, so that's Time to Click, um, Finding Love in 2045 and Awoken in 2046. Have a look at the previews and uh, you tell me if you think um, it desperately needs a, a fresh professional edit. So, I'll go um, look it up after we finish the podcast. You, you have a look after. <laughs> but the funny thing then, is, uh, like you come back to me and tell me, tell me what you think. Um, I'll be uh, be interested now. And anybody, um, comment on the channel, um, or contact me via, via Twitter, and uh, and just let me know. Um, so I'd love to have extra feedback if there's something that uh, I need to do extra. 
Um, right then, we are running out of time. I'm certainly wishing you well with the Love Mentalist. And uh, when's that all coming out for you, Shanae? I think the first book's coming out in May and the second book will be coming out at the end of the year. But I'm self-publishing First Wives Reprisal, which is the one I'm working on now. Um, and mm -hmm. people say, why are you self-publishing when you've got a publisher? Well, to get a book out takes 12 months. So yeah. I can't, my uh, um, publisher has other authors. They, they can't just concentrate on my books. So, no. And I write, because I, I am confined to bed a lot these days, I tend to write three to five books a year. So I can't expect them to publish, um, you know, just to concentrate on me and publish my books. So, I think that's a good um, mix. So it's a good mix to have um, some published work and some self-published work, I think. I think that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Um, and now I've got the podcast. Um, I'm concentrating a lot on that. I'm having a lot of fun on that. So with my co-host Katrina. So, um, well, we'll, yeah, people, so that's going along fine. We will we will put in the description for people to see. So they'll be able to go have a look at your podcast, go and have a listen to your podcast as well. And uh, links to all your socials and that that is in the description. So um, thanks very much, Sh Shanae. That has been excellent. And uh, from me, Simon Ward, the host of the Bunny Author podcast, thank you very much for listening. And uh, we see you again. Subscribe. And uh, if you subscribe, then um, every episode shows us a view regardless. So that's uh, that's all good for me too. So thanks for that. <laughs> right then. Thank you very much. Cheers. Bye-bye. <laughs>